That was fun, wasn't it? Oh, that was so fun. I love it. Love seeing all those kids and got them all here for the first service and obviously for the second service. It's exciting. Thank the Lord. It's one of the things that we always kind of wrestled with was uh, getting all the kids here for both services. You know, most of them come at the second service. And the fact that they have a, a big choir like this and all the kids coming in for both makes it really special for sure. So thank the Lord. And thank you, Lord, for all of those that work so diligently with our children. Amen? What a, what a blessing. What a privilege. Today we're going to study from Romans chapter 11. Father, thank you for the privilege that you have given to all of us to be here today to study the Bible, but not just to study the Bible, but studying the Bible so that we might know you, that we will be more acquainted with your ways, your promises, the blessings that you have provided all of us, and your people Israel. Indeed, we are studying about them in these past weeks, and even today as we already pointing forward in celebration of the Christmas date that we have allowed to remind us of the birth of Christ, that we together understand that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. And as a result of your sovereign work, even with Israel, to all the nations, the Savior of the world. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, we do thank you for coming and willingly submitting yourself to the will of your Father in the counsel that occurred from before the foundations of the world and the, the times were developed. In the divine counsel, the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you planned for our redemption to come and to humble yourself take on the form of a servant and come in the likeness of sinful men so that you may live among us sinless indeed but still subject to the things of this world and the persecutions of this world and the pains of this world that you might redeem us unto yourself through your own shed blood and we also thank you so that you rose from the dead. Death could not hold you. And we are so thankful to know that you're alive and interceding for us today. And in this process of studying about Israel, knowing that you're going to bring them back from the dead as well. Today, a remnant. Tomorrow, their fullness. And all the nations will rejoice. And you will be exalted. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you that your word is true. That you keep your promises to Israel and you keep your promises to us. And we can have confidence in you. Nourish us today as we study the Bible together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Romans chapter 11, I'll just read from verse 1 for context. We left off in verse 8, I think I'd like to kind of pick up there again, probably work through verse 12 today if we have time. I made mention last week and maybe Wednesday that I would talk a little bit about our present dilemma in the country as well little bit of political update and um, probably don't have much more to share than you already know but many have asked you know, why I've been so quiet about the political environment and of course COVID and vaccinations all come into play and all that stuff but um, I want to focus on the word and uh, if we get an opportunity I'll bring some of that in as well today so Let's start in verse 1. I say then, has God cast away his people? 
Certainly not, he answers. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. I think we talked about that for a while last week. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. I'll stop there for today. So going back into verse 8, we picked up on this, or we, let, we kind of dealt with this a bit last week, and I want to pick up on it again today. God has given them a spirit of stupor or slumber, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And it's interesting to me that Paul uses this passage to indicate not only from the perspective of Israel's history, but also to the very present hour that they are under a spirit of slumber to this very day. Now, of course, he said that in the first century. He was referring to a passage in Deuteronomy when the children of Israel were just getting ready to go into the land of Israel and prophetically telling them what would be happening to them and tying it together to the present hour in which they have been given a spirit of slumber to this present day because of their rejection of Jesus as Messiah. Now, we talked about this a bit last week, but let's review as we keep working our way through this, and then I'd like to take you to a couple of passages otherwise uh, to read through. First of all, you have Israel who were developed the, the, the nation was developed in Egypt, and out of Egypt they were called through Moses, the delivering prophet. You are familiar. And so during the processes that God hardened the Pharaoh's heart to make himself known to Pharaoh, to Egypt, and to the Israelis, and likewise to us, uh, God hardened his heart so that he could demonstrate his power, but ultimately a allowed for Israel to be drawn out of Egypt and out through uh, the, a passage in the Red Sea and up through the Sinai so that they could go up toward the promised land that God would give them. And in the process, because of their unbelief, when they came to Kadesh Barnea, they said, look, we can't go in. Uh, we're afraid There's giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers. Uh, And God, through the processes of their unbelief, chose in his sovereignty to teach them a potent lesson by having them wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. At that time, they were given a spirit of slumber, a spirit of stupor. I think that the New Testament translators here, this is the New King James Version, 
uh, utilized that because of the fact that they were wandering around in circles in the wilderness. I mean, literally just going around and around and uh, wasting time. It took uh, typically about 14 days for them to go uh, in from where they were located into the land. And they took 40 years to do it because God said, look, all of you that are above the age of 20 are going to wander about in the wilderness until you die off. And it would be these younger, the younger generation that would be allowed to go in. And so that takes us fast forward from the children of Israel having been given a spirit of slumber or a spirit of stupor to this very day, to the second wave of that passage being fulfilled. And that would be related to the fact that these children now that have grown up and they're in Moab and Moses is giving kind of final uh, remarks to them and is about to send them across the Jordan into the uh, promised land. They've already conquered a couple of kings in a couple of areas and uh, a couple of the tribes would stay on this side or part of them would stay on this side of the Jordan. The rest would go into the promised land. They are being warned by Moses that God is going to give them a spirit of slumber. And he says to them, you've already had this in your historical uh, life, in the, in the family as it's been developed, and now you guys are going to go into the land. And he gives them promises and blessings and says, if you go into the land, don't learn the way of the heathen, don't engage in idolatry, uh, obey the Lord your God, keep him forefront before you always. Uh, and then he tells them, but when you don't, which you, you would, I don't know about you, I would just be thinking, I wish I could try at least to pay attention to the fact that God has already told me I'm going to fail, so I'm going to try harder not to fail. I, I don't know if you're like that, but I would be. And yet, they go in and they're going to fail anyway, and he's, they're told they're going to fail, and that God will give them a spirit of slumber to this very day. Now, let's take this moment to go to Deuteronomy 29. Uh, I think I read for you from Deuteronomy 30 when we were in chapter 9. And so this just backs us up a little bit, but I think I'll try to pick out a verse or two that I can give you to help with this. I won't read the whole chapter, but let's just look at verse 2. So Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 2. Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials which your eyes have seen, the signs and those great wonders, Yet the Lord has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. And so you can see where Paul is picking this up. Verse 14 tells us, I will make this covenant and this oath not with you alone. And this is an important passage. I make this covenant and this oath not with you alone but with him who stands here with us today before the Lord our God, as well as with him who is not here with us today. So now this is the group that are beyond 20, the older generation. After the 40 years, everyone else has died off. The younger generation is being prepared from Moab to go. And he says, I'm making this covenant and this oath with you, but not with you alone. But it will be for others that are not here with us today. And he sends them out in this context, making certain that they know that this is going to come forward into generations. Now, if you would, let's go to Psalm 69. I'm listening for pages. See, that's what I don't like about the screen. Thank you. Yeah, just wiggle them up, if you, especially loud, if you have opportunity. And I'm taking you here to recite for you a bit from what Paul is drawing from. And also to kind of pull together what's happening when he says this is not for just you that it will go across the Jordan today, but for those that are not here with us today, looking forward into the future. That 
by the time we get to where Paul is addressing the Romans, Jesus has come and has been rejected by his own, given opportunity to enhance their own lives by faith in their Messiah and involvement in the kingdom, and yet they reject their king and forfeit their rights to the kingdom. I'm looking at the clock, seeing if I have time to digress. Just, I'll, I'll give you this much. Um, there's a passage in Matthew that says, many will come in that day and they will see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom and they themselves cast into outer dark or cast out and ultimately into outer darkness. And Christians often read that related to themselves because of what they did and didn't do or the, the, the disobedience and so forth. It relates to, entirely to the Jews. And so the Jews are at this point uh, being told, look, you guys aren't going to enter the kingdom because you're rejecting your Messiah. And so they were under a spirit of slumber to that very day. And now, moving forward, having rejected their Messiah, in mass, the nation of Israel rejecting Jesus is under a spirit of slumber to this very day. Now we're dealing with the first century. And in the first century, moving forward to today, this day in which you and I are here in this building having a Bible study there's still the great majority of the nation of Israel that are in that state of spiritual slumber and blindness. And it has come as a result of their rebellion against the Lord. And so I wanted to take you to this uh, psalm, which is a messianic psalm, and it's cited for us in Romans chapter 11. And it, it's very interesting because it pulls together for us the fact that it was not just that first spirit of slumber, as it were, or the first wave, or the second wave, which was after the 40 years. Uh, and then it manifested later under the leadership of Isaiah. I remember how this has been discussed in our earlier studies, where Isaiah is commissioned by the Lord to go and tell those that went to inhabit the land, seeing you will no longer see, hearing you will no longer hear. But now, even to this day, having rejected Jesus as their Messiah, they are then again given a third wave of blindness, uh, only to suffer through this period of blindness, through the tribulation period, and until the time of the second coming, when the Lord will actually make himself known to them permanently and finally, and he will never hide his face from them ever again. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 39, last few verses. But look at this Psalm of David. Now, you guys know already that I believe that most of the Psalms are the prayer life of Jesus written before his incarnation from outside of time and inserted into the time continuum, and in this case, through David. So let me confuse you some more. What I am suggesting to you is that many of the Psalms, not, I'm not suggesting all of them, nor every word of them, but many of the Psalms are the written prayer life of Jesus, written through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit from before the time that Jesus was incarnated, he, before his birth and his natural life. And so from outside of time, the recorded prayers are being given through David or the other psalmists so that we can get pictures and pieces and parts of what was going on that is absent from us in the gospel periods. For example, you guys have heard Jesus from the cross say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But in Psalm 22, the entire prayer is listed. It starts off, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But it continues to go through. They pierce my hands and my feet and they mock me and they've divided my garments. And it's, it's the prayer of Jesus as he's hanging on the cross, written by David years earlier through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And this one is the same. This one is the same. And so this is a messianic psalm. It relates to Jesus' childhood. There's pieces that we get that we wouldn't normally get, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Gospels. Uh, yeah, I'll take a drink of water. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks. Ah. 
I decided I wasn't going to mention the oxygen today. I was just going to wear it and not say anything and be nice. And now I've, I feel compelled. The oxygen is blowing up in my head, which is terrible because I hear it. Pssst. And then it's cold, and I'm already cold. And then it also dries out my throat. And so thank you. God bless you, sir. Let's read this together. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. Hey, there's a connection. <laughs> my eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me. Being my enemies wrongfully, though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. I mean, you can see a little bit of this already. I mean, there was a time, and I, I won't get too deep into this, but there was a time that Jesus was in a pit under Caiaphas' house where he was held captive overnight, awaiting his uh, final execution, as it were, by crucifixion. And the prayers that he offered there in that pit are recorded. There's many of them in the Psalms. And in this case, they would throw people down in there, and prisoners died in there, and they had to uh, relieve themselves down in there, and there was no, I mean, it was horrible. And for Jesus to be in this kind of condition, we know this is related to much uh, in the Psalms. Now, I would also like to add to you, uh, though, in this case, that there is an indication of the way he is feeling with the people. Waters in the Bible, especially the seas and, and large bodies of water, represent peoples and people groups. And so he feels overwhelmed with all the people and the people that hate him without a cause. And now he is restoring what he hasn't even stolen himself. And so there's some indications in there. Verse 5 is the most troubling for most. Oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. And the first thing we would suggest is Jesus couldn't say that. He had no sin, nor was iniquity found in him. And that is absolutely true. Remember, David wrote this, and so there's a Davidic aspect of this that's bleeding through, as much as there is a Messianic aspect that's bleeding through. But I might also mention to you that it is not impossible to understand that he himself became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so as you are righteous, 100% righteous in the Lord, Jesus himself became sin for us and identified with sinful men, humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Verse 6 says, let not those who wait for you, O Lord of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confused or confounded because of me, O God of Israel, because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children, his half-brothers, sisters, uh, where you have, um, well, you know this. Joseph was not Jesus' natural father. He was born of a virgin. Uh, but nonetheless, a stranger to his brothers. I mean, early, in his earlier years, uh, uh, prior to his resurrection, they, they didn't believe in him. They thought he was crazy. You, know, you say you, you are Who? You know, and all those in Nazareth as well, the people that he grew up with, they would reject him. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up. You've probably heard that quotation from the New Testament. And the reproaches of those who reproached you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to, the, to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. How many times have we seen that? I'm, I'm refraining from making too many comments. I could probably spend the next three weeks just teaching the psalm, and we'd never get anywhere else. But as for me, my prayers to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time, 
O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation and deliver me out of the mire and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor let deep swallow me up and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies, and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none to... Uh, there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. You're familiar with that passage. Let their table, this is the citation from Romans 11, let their table become a snare before them, and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see. And make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents for they persecute the ones you have struck. Or the one you have struck. That's added by the translator by the way. And talk of the grief of those who have, you have wounded. <clears throat> Add iniquity to their iniquity and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me on, uh, up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull which has horns and hooves. That is better than a sacrifice of a bull or an ox. The humble shall see this and be glad, and you who seek God, your hearts shall live. For the Lord hears the poor and does not despise the prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servant shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. And so you can see in the midst of this prayer, you can see his complaint, you can see his desire for judgment upon his enemies, but you also see a promise of a future restoration. I mentioned this to you last week. When God rebukes the people, even if you're looking, for example, in Ezekiel or in Isaiah, this is compounded over and over again in the discipline. He always gives them hope. And that's what's happening in chapter 11 because we're looking forward to the restoration of Israel in this passage. So go back to Romans chapter 11 and let's pick up what Paul is talking about here. And he says to them, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not See and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Remember, he, this was prayed for. And then David says, verse 9, as we just referenced, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. Now, I'm not going to get through all this today. I can see already, but let me at least read forward the next two verses for hope. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? As in the psalm we just read, no. Because God has already communicated not only their demise, but also their restoration. Those that seek the Lord are going to dwell in the land. I say then, should they, uh, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles this Gentile element in the Israeli connection we've been talking about for weeks. For if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. So there's a fullness yet to come. 
how much more their fullness. He goes on to tell them that there will be a time of full restoration, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next Sunday. But today, because of the desire that you have asked of me for some discussion on the political environment, I'm going to segue off of this in verse 9. And again, highlight the literal context and then bring some connection to it. So David says in verse 9, let their table become a snare and a trap. Uh, cited in the Psalm 69. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow down their back always. That's uh, an adaption in this quotation. Uh, let, let them be bowed over. Let them have this heavy burden that they have to, to wear as a result of the darkening of their eyes or the spirit of stupor that they're dealing with to this very day. Uh, as they were, when they're wandering around in circles in the wilderness, uh, God kept them blind from even the realities of the directives uh, that they should be following. Still providing for them, still caring for them, Still making promises for them, but it's nonetheless allowing them to suffer uh, the consequences of their own rebellions. So let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. For the Jews, and we've already been dealing with this exhaustively in our study, for the Jews, the table that was provided to them. I mean, consider the blessings that come at the table. I mean, these are the things that God has provided to Israel. Let their table become a snare. Let, let them get trapped up in what you have provided them. Now, he provided them promises. He provided them the law. He had a covenant with them. He will keep his covenant, but in the processes of bringing to fruition everything he has promised them, they become confused. In as much as they're wandering around in circles in the wilderness, they have wandered around in circles within the framework of the covenant that God made them, the promises of blessings that he made them, at the curses that they would suffer if they disobeyed him, and in fact, the law itself. Now remember, their righteousness, they were seeking righteousness by the law, and righteousness did not come by the law. It came by grace through faith. We've covered this a lot. This is the whole purpose that Paul is making with the, the Romans, the argument that he's making with the Romans. And so their table becomes a snare and a stumbling block, a trap. Without getting into too much detail on this, I want to just point out the fact that the Bible says that the law was given as a schoolmaster or a tutor to bring them to Christ. And so in as much as this short journey in the wilderness should have been uh, just that, a short journey to a destination, it ended up becoming a problem for them where they wandered in the wilderness until they all died off, those that were above 20. Now, the law that was given to them that should have been pointing them to God became God to them. I'm going to say that again so that you will not lose what I'm after here. The law was a schoolmaster to bring them to Christ. The law was given them by their creator. But instead of worshiping and serving the creator, they began to worship and serve the law. They became so enamored with the promises of God that they no longer were enamored with the God of the promises. Hello, America. Okay. Now, you get it. We, we don't have to do a whole study on the history of Israel to, to understand this because we recognize that they rejected their own Messiah, their own Creator. And it, indeed, all the blessings and all the promises that God had made them, the things that were intended for their good became a snare and a trap and a stumbling block to them. Even Jesus, the, the cornerstone, became a rock of offense. We've covered this as we've been working our way through Romans 9, 10, and 11. Today, I think this is where we are in America. And uh, 
I should, I should probably just prepare for you to become angry with me now. And so please pay careful attention. When Americans become... I'm, 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 I, I wish I had like a bulletproof shield right now before I go here. When Americans become more in love with the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and our freedom, then we are in love with the God who created us, who is recognized by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights and has provided us freedom, we will lose. Our own blessings will become a trap and a recompense unto us and a snare. You guys are probably familiar with some of the expressions from the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, one of which comes to mind right away, uh, that we have a creator and that all men are created equal and endowed with unalienable rights. And all of a sudden, we become so enamored with our, quote, rights that we fail to recognize our creator. And so I want to focus on just two things and then I'll just probably disappoint you because I'm not a prophet. And I'm not going to tell you what's going to happen in the immediate future. I can tell you what's going to happen in the distant future because I have a Bible in front of me. Israel, over and over again, are rebuked by the prophets because they forgot their creator. Now, obviously, I'm extrapolating and I'm developing this uh, without biblical context because I can give you the understanding from Israel, but with America, America is not in view in the Bible. America is not in the Bible. Uh, some people would argue that, I'll argue back. Um, the point that I'm trying to make here, though, is that there is a, pe a pattern and a lesson that we can learn. And so, as much as God rebuked Israel because they have forgotten their creator... America has forgotten its creator. We, even the constitutionalists, even we conservatives, I'm one. I'm a constitutionalist. I'm a, I'm a, 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 a conservative, a Republican, you know. I voted for Trump. I still hope he is the next, or the continuing president. I believe that the Democrats have cheated. I think it's very obvious um, but we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We'll, I'll come back to that, I guess. But there is a great deal of love for the Constitution and for the Bill of Rights and for our freedoms that s somehow eclipses our love for God. We've forgotten the God who created us. And it starts to be manifested by our public schools. <clears throat> Again, I want the bulletproof shield. If your children are in public school, I do not condemn you. Some p parents have no options. Uh, if your kids are in an environment where they are being introduced to evolutionary theory, it is not science. Then... They need to be protected. But we as Americans who claim our foundation by a creator and that we held and hold these certain unalienable rights to be endowed upon us by our creator are the same people who often have laid down and allowed evolution to be taught at all and to literally take over our educational systems from kindergarten and all the way up. By the way, I'll just offend everybody. Might as well get it over with. If you send your children to a university 
to college. If you're not sending them to a Bible teaching Bible college, you are sending your kids into hell. Now, that doesn't mean your kids can't pass through hell and still love Jesus. And God keeps those that are his. We all understand that. But we should be at least aware of the fact that what these institutions are doing and their agenda. This is not a secret. And it starts when they're just babies. Everything is there. Uh, all this stuff. I mean, every science program, it seems like, on TV and the History Channel and all the stuff that's being shoved down the throats of Americans and the rest of the world is in embracing a world without a creator. And so without taking much more time on that, we need to repent as believers of allowing ourselves to be soft on this so-called doctrine of evolution. It is not science. And their so-called theories, by the way, are based on the same exact um, materials that we will base creation science upon minus one thing. They look at a fossil, they interpret a certain way. We look at a fossil and interpret a certain way. They say this happened by accident. We say this happened through the act of a, div of a divine and one and only true God, the creator. And so they are minus God. We have God and they have none. They are a cosmic accident. We are intentionally loved and created by God. And yet, still, we allow ourselves to embrace this and allow it to be taught, and we don't know how to answer for it. The second thing that Americans need to repent of is the breakdown of the family. The um, marriage, we think about marriage right away. But it's worse than that, you guys. I, man, I know I'm going to offend a bunch of you now. But again, why not? Feminism is part of the problem. Transgenderism is part of the problem. And transgenderism manifests itself in role reversals even in the home. It doesn't have to do with sexual parts and sexual activity altogether. Transgenderism can be where we've neutralized the difference between men and women and leadership. It's even happening in the churches. Now we ordain women to be pastors. This is wrong. It's unbiblical. And the church, if they're going to repent of something, that's one place to start. Female pastors. Ladies, I love you. Don't be mad at me. Why, why, let me just put this little caveat in there. The reason that God puts men in the lead is because he wants the women to be cherished and protected, not vulnerable. And so it's not that God doesn't love women or think that they're less than. They're not less than. They're not less intelligent, but they are preferred in grace. God wants them protected so that they can be cherished and, and loved like a bride is cherished by her husband. I can't develop all this in one day. I realize it right away. But the LGBT community, the transgender agenda, the, it's all infected the church. Even if we don't think that it's okay to ordain homosexuals for ministry or if we think that <coughs> homosexuality is a sin, we still allow it to come creeping in by role reversals and, and neutralizations, gender neutralizations. And role reversals that, that have penetrated into our society. And then the worst from some perspectives, at least, and I think that all sin is 
equally horrifying in the eyes of God. But to reject the creator, to totally break down the family. We're talking about marriage and divorce. We're talking about uh, the transgender and the feminization, all of this stuff. And that includes, by the way, chauvinism, guys. If you're being a jerk because you're a man, stop it. I won't leave the... I, girls, thank you for reminding me I, that I won't leave the men off the hook. But then we have abortion. I, I, I have to tell you, I was in the hospital. I'm laying in my hospital bed. and I remember calling to Pastor Tim, and these guys were having a, a prayer gathering over at the Speedway. Uh, maybe some of you went to it. I wasn't able to be there. I'm, I'm on the phone with Tim, and they're having this, and they're calling everyone to come in and gather together for worship and repentance. And immediately I wanted to say, well, what are you repenting of? See, again, I have no time for, to develop all this. But, uh, you know, if we're repenting as a nation, if I'm repenting for my neighbor who doesn't know the Lord and for the behaviors that he has engaged in, I really can't repent for him. So what are we repenting of? Uh, the church needs to repent. 40% of the Christians in America did not vote this election. Boy, that's a responsibility we should be repenting for. The fact that we have been soft on abortion. The fact that we've been soft on the LGBTQ agenda. It's an agenda. It's not just a sinful behavior. Those are the things that we can repent for. We can repent for the fact that we have not defended the biblical worldview, the creator, and spoken out verbally and intentionally into a society that believes that we are a cosmic accident by saying, no, we will not have that in our schools. That is not science. It cannot be repeated in a laboratory. You will not teach it. I could go on and on. And so what are we repenting of? But let me give you, I, I'm going to run out of time here. Let me give you some good news. Here, I'm putting on my glasses. I don't even have my glasses on. COVID brain. There's still hope, but the hope is not going to be in America. It's not going to be in our Constitution. It's not going to be in our Bill of Rights. Look, if Joe Biden becomes the next president and Kamala Harris, uh, leads him you didn't get that and if we lose the two seats in the senate in georgia and with the house already being controlled by the left we're done but if trump becomes president or continues in office We're done anyway. It's only a matter of time. Unless America genuinely repents. And let's just give focus to these three things. Creation and its creator. The recognition of God. The one who gave us what is substantially supported by the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. If we worship the Constitution more than the creator... We've lost everything. If you're a Jew and you say, the, we have the law, you've lost everything because you, your hope is not in the law. Your hope is in the Lord. And America, your hope is not in the Constitution. It is in the God who gave you the wisdom to be able to write this Constitution. And if you forget God, you have lost everything. And when we look at our history and we know where we're going, and the Bible tells us that every nation is going to turn against Israel. We know that America will lose its way and will no longer worship God. So the words of Barack Obama, the worst president in my lifetime for sure, said America is no longer a Christian nation. Turns out maybe he was right. I hate to say that. But where are we going? We are a people that need to get back to God. 
We need to exalt the creator. We need to exalt and defend the family. And we need to exalt and defend life. It's amazing to me that we could say constitutionally that people have a right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness or the ownership of property, depending on your timeline. Life is the first word. It's constitutionally protected, and we kill our babies. What in the heck is that? And I said, heck, not hell, because I wanted to say hell. I'm out of time. I'm putting on my glasses again without them. But here's the hope. Our hope is not in America. It's not in the Constitution. If we can maintain it, if we can push back the darkness, if we can hold back the darkness, I'm all in, man. I want to do that with every ounce of my being. But America is under judgment, and there is no question about it. We are going to be judged. It's a matter of time. And ultimately, we're going to be a people that are not going to be able to say we're going to trust in America and our 501c3 and our happy little churching and all the freedoms that we enjoy. Hey, man, everything that's happening now, I don't have time, but everything that's happening right now is a systematic methodology of trying to take away your freedom and to see how dumb we can be and how easily led we can be. I don't have time for all that. But I'll just end with this. If you want to be one who will enjoy the kingdom, and we're going to get to this in Romans, if you want to be one of those individuals that will enjoy the blessings of God, that the, the table that's been prepared for you in a wilderness, then you have to know the God who prepared the table, not just the table. The bread and the wine and the meat and the bitter herbs and whatever else might be part of your portion at that table has to be recognized as the gift from God. And may the Lord allow us to grow in the knowledge of who he is. And my dear friends, I love America. We have so many friends that have given their lives to defend us in this state, in this country. And, and your friends and, and relatives that have served I, am, I defend them and I stand with them in this process. I'm not disrespecting the flag, but I'm just telling you, our flag is subject to an almighty God. And I want to defend our flag as our flag defends our God. And we are the people, the church, the voice, as a whole unit to prophesy about this coming storm and we are the people that will only stand as we stand firmly on the Lord. Everything else will fail, but God will never fail. Amen. Amen.